Okay, guys, so let's start. And yeah, thank you once more for joining us today on this webinar and switch here. My name is Vladimir. I'm head of product at the Oil Institute. And today we have a great guest who has like 4 a.m. right now his local time, Ben, founder of Coxcon. Ben, are you here? Yes, I'm here. Can you hear me? Yep, yep. Thanks, thanks for having me. Um, pleasure to be here. Okay, guys, so in the next about 40 minutes, we will try to cover a couple of important topics, starting from what is quad quality you watch for and why you should care about it and how it will help you in the future. Uh, we'll go through a bit about CodeScan itself and the Open Suite itself. And then to be the most important or interesting part of this webinar, we will show you how you can very easily perform static code analysis with CodeScan in the Open Suite. And then Ben will show you what other great options and capabilities CodeScan provides you with its different approaches like cloud one or self-hosted one. And of course, at the end, you have a Q&A session. So I believe that you'll fit everything in about 40 minutes and you will have about five or 10 minutes more for questions. So please don't hesitate to like write your questions. As we go, we might try to ask for them, but anyway, we'll ask for them in the end of our webinar. So let's start. And first of all, let's start with the like, definition of what is code quality and like, why it's important for you. So by default, like high quality code is code that is working, that implements some business rules, business features. It should work, it should be bug free, ideally. And in Salesforce's world, we can't code, call the code like high quality if it's not covered with unit tests, with at least 75% coverage, but okay, 100% coverage. And also we can't call it high quality if it doesn't uh, play well against like DML rules, DML limits and the performance issues. But like really, is it enough? Is it really real definition of high quality code? Or is it just a definition of somehow meaningful code? Let's take a look at a couple of examples. So here you can see a pretty clean class almost. Yeah, so not so like nothing very ugly, nothing very uh, like, I don't know, disappointing here, but would you like guys like to support it in the future? Would you like to modify it? Do you see all this stuff right here? Like lots of nested ifs, some like hard coded uh, constants, values, lots of different small issues that are not uh, helping you to support it in the future. And my favorite one really is that try catch blocks with this catch. I love this, especially when you have any issues and it will be a real nightmare to debug this method. Or another example, it's a bit more uglier one, I'd say. So we have lots of nested uh, if statements here, we have lots of conditions, we have lots of uh, hard-coded uh, values. And to me, really, guys, I pretend that I'm sick, but I won't modify this code. I won't do any changes here because I'm pretty sure that I will miss something important in this code. And really, if you like somehow scroll down the screenshot and you'll see that there is about 60 more lines of else ifs in the same method. So it kind of works. I believe it uh, like fulfills all of the requirements that we've set in the previous slides. So it works. It, uh, you know, like it is bug free, I believe. It uh, fulfills some business rules. But really, I don't want to support it. And I believe that like nobody of you would like to support such kind of code in the future. Or simplest example, it looks pretty good, there is nothing horrible, there is nothing very complex, but again, guys, how many time would you spend just trying to understand what are all these variables, trying to understand what do they mean and what this method really does? Like really, even with the comment here, it's nothing very helpful. And while this code is not ugly, it's still not very friendly and it still will take time to understand how it works and what it does really. So let's try to add some more definitions to the code quality and what, what do we mean by the high quality code. So like, of course, it should be fully functional, working, bug free, it's like not ups. But in addition, it, it should be easy to maintain. So in case if you have any issues, if you have some uh, bugs in the future, of course, everybody have bugs, but really, let's be real. If you need to uh, do some minor changes on it, you should be able to do this quickly. If you need to extend the fun functionality, you need to be able to do this quickly instead of rewriting everything from scratch or wasting one of your full day just trying to understand what happens in that code. And of course, you should be sure that if you extend this code, 
the something won't break after your changes. And the main part for me personally is that it should be readable and understandable. I believe most of us guys are using somehow code reviews. We are reviewing code of other guys. We are maintaining some other's code. And when we reach out to the code that is not readable, that has variable names of one, two symbols, that is not formatted at all, and it just looks strange, it's not readable. We hate other people who wrote that code. So I believe one of our main goals is to make the code readable and understandable by a human, not by some like compiler, Salesforce, or anybody else. So from my point of view, and I believe Ben will agree with me, that these are almost main rules for what to call the high quality code. What do you think, Ben? Yes, absolutely. I, 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 love, I love the examples, uh, or, or hate the examples, depending on how you look at it. Um, yeah, it's that, um, there's a term that we use uh, called the time to context. So, so when you look at a, at a piece of code, uh, how long does it take your brain to adapt and to figure out what's going on? That's the time to context. And, um, and and we've kind of done a little bit of looking around and try to try to figure out, you know, how, how much how how big an effect does uh, time to context have on your development? And we've uh, we've figured out it's 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 many hours per week. Uh, I, I'd have to, I think uh, I think we're talking ten or twenty hours uh, per month of, of of time you waste on on when you have bad code, the amount of time you waste switching context in your brain to, to try and understand what's going on. So CodeScan is there to try and help that, to try and um, guide developers uh, to, um, to, to write better code all the time. Um, so uh, CodeScan is, is a code quality uh, a toolkit. Uh, it focuses purely on Salesforce code. Um, it's, it's the engine uh, that, uh, that Vladimir is going to uh, um, introduce to you that's, that's, uh, that's running this um, uh, an analysis on your code in, uh, in Welcome Suite. So, um, but CodeScan uh, exists as a, as a, uh, as a, web, um, a, a, a web tool and you can um, run your code through this as part of a workflow. I'll show that to you a bit later. Um, but you know, it's helping for code reviews and onboarding and training is a big part of what we do to help. But uh, anyway, let's um, let's talk about um, uh, CodeScan itself. It's is a is a tool. Uh, it's um, it's been around for five years. We've had uh, more than a thousand installs, um, and we've got um, yeah, lots of big companies are using it. And if you're a, 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 a discount um, a not-for-profit, we can give you a, a big discount. Uh, so come over to our website. Um, it's uh, www.code-scan.com, and um, there's a free trial there. And uh, I think, um, Vladimir, did, did, shall we come back and discuss a little bit about CodeScan later, or um, or do you want to run your demo first? So, uh, yeah, guys, sorry. I, I, I was switching slides while Ben was talking, so it was like a bit of going here and there, but uh, if you, uh, so like anyway, Ben, like we'll show you the code scan later, how it works, and we'll go into more details, but in, in general, mm -hmm. like I believe that's the like overview, it's here. I, I see here some nice numbers from Ben, and I really love them. So the decrease in production yeah, so, bugs. Yeah, so production bugs, it, it reduces production bugs, and we've seen people get, yeah, you know, those these, these big numbers of uh, of the amount of uh, reduction and production bugs, um, and other other others focusing on on um, on scalability of their dev team. You know, once when you have a better automated way of checking your um, your uh, the code, so having a having a peer review system in place is it is still necessary in your in your team, but but you can actually um, uh, make those peer reviews more efficient. So instead of instead of needing to peer review those nitty gritty little um, you know syntactical problems that you you know like some of these examples that Lerman has shown, your peer reviews will focus on 
on um, on semantics, on on like on architecture, on the really really important things. And anyway, so when you and when you can only focus on that, then your your senior developers will uh, will come uh, that that hopefully some of the peer reviews will will be able to help um, you know the the other guys a lot more uh, efficiently. Um, so uh, yeah, so that's that's a really uh, good point. And then the other uh, thing here we've got is is about onboarding and training. Um, so it's, onboarding and training is obviously a big part of uh, of um, of scaling uh, the team or you know even in general. Um, the uh, a tool like CodeScan and, and pointing out uh, like developers don't read manuals like it's just a thing. <laughs> I don't know why. I don't either. But when you have a tool that's sitting there and constantly saying, "Hey, this is this is the way we do it in our organization," you know, um, um, it's 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 like a training tool, and, and it really works. It's instead of um, you know hitting, telling people what to do, you just you know gently show them this is this is how you should write your code. Um, so you know, that's what CodeScan is all about: helping you write better code. It's it's a web tool. It's worked. Um, improvement tool, which I'll show you later. Uh, yeah, it's Letterman. Great, great. Thanks, Ben. And I, I just wanted to add from my experience regarding code reviews. I love code reviews. They are a great way to uh, ensure that everybody in the team are on the same page, that some like global decisions are made correctly. But like really small issues, syntax issues, small patterns, like violations, small uh, like code styling or code guidelines, rules, violations. In my experience, they are missed in 90% times because nobody cares about like reading symbol by symbol whatever you wrote. People are mostly focusing on just understanding if your logic is correct, and that's it. So like why code reviews are a very important thing, but still I think that they are not very efficient in terms of ensuring the uh, code guidelines, uh, proper code guidelines, and like some small best practices, I'd say so. But yeah, let's uh, let's take like talk for two minutes for one minute about what is the Vulkan suit. So for those of you guys who are not aware about the Vulkan suit, it's a full stack Salesforce ID for the whole team. Yep, I'm not reading from the slide. It's just the best way to describe it. And our main ideas for the Vulkan suit are to bring the same functionality and the same like whole experience to the whole team, including developers, administrators, and those who are doing like point and click development. So we are like tool set with lots of different small features and tools integrated all together. So they are not the separated parts of uh, your application flow of your development flow. They are tightly integrated with each other. And code scan integration will be a good example and I'll show it to you in a minute. And of course, like one of our main goals no, it's, it's still the main goal for us, is just to increase your performance in day-to-day -day tasks. And starting from doing less clicks in tasks that you're doing 100 times per day, and up to stop wasting your time on looking for stupid bugs or for looking for remembering all of the guidelines like CoSCAN does. So instead of like taking in your memory all of the uh, your best practices, all of the guidelines for the team, and then reviewing all the stuff yourself manually each time before you push to the organization or before you commit to the Git repository. Instead of this, the tool should do this for you. And yeah, of course, as we are all developers, we are all people, we are very interested in working in a comfortable environment because when we hate our environment, we are fighting with it. Our goal is to make you comfortable in the tool almost like in the, your sofa near your TV in the evening. Not so good, but still somewhere close to it. But okay, guys, let's stop talking and I'll switch to something a bit more interesting. So, the work suit itself and how to work with code scan in it. So, I'm a Windows guy, so I'll show you the Windows version of the work suit while we still have the Mac version and code scan is as well working there greatly. So, in our case, <clears throat> once you install the work suit, you don't need to uh, additionally do anything regarding the code scan except of obtaining a license or trial or purchasing a license. but and Ben will cover this a bit more. And uh, in our case, we already bundle ourselves a command line interface of uh, CoScan. So whatever you need to do is just go to Tools, Options, then navigate to External Tools, 
Here you can find code scan and you just need to type in your license. Or right here, not type in, just copy paste it. Once you've done it, you're good to go. So what I have here, I have here my project open, my sample projects that I'm using for the last couple of years. So there's lots of classes here, there's some of other panels. I will hide them because I won't show you anything in the ID. I'd like to, but I skip this. So let's take a look at a couple of examples of the code that we have. So one of them is just some random class that I took when I was looking at it in the morning today. And for me, it looks unreadable, maybe because of lots of comments. I don't want even to try to understand what happens in this code. I see lots of, like, whoa, whoa. I believe it's one of my examples being honest. So I see lots of ifs and I'd hate changing them. And I have second class here that is real, really my first example from the uh, presentation. Yep, thank you guys. I will maximize or I will just zoom it a bit. Not so much, but some, somehow this way. So this is the class from my examples for sure. So again, it doesn't look ugly, but I believe there is a lot of issues here. And instead of trying to manually understand what is incorrect here, let's use code scan to show us what are the issues with this code as well as with all other classes in my project. So as for any static analysis tool, the show begins with the rule set, with the definition of what rules you'd like to include. And one of the best things from my point of view about CodeScan is the amount of rules they provide us. So I will go to the tools and I go to the CodeScan rule set configuration. It's empty window, nothing interesting here. So I can create a new empty rule set and do all the magic on my own, but it's too much for me. So I will start from the default template provided by CodeScan guys. And let's maximize the window and take a look what we see here. So on the left side, we see a bunch of categories. I believe it's about one, two, three. Okay, it's about 15 different categories. And we have here 180 something, like 83 or 88 rules provided by CodeScan guys. As you can see, some of them are already checked in. And let's take a look at what's selected by default. So I'll go into the more interesting categories for me. And let's just take a look what we have here. So using Gluton, we have a documentation here for classes that only have static methods use singleton, makes sense, okay. I can also click on, click on read the documentation and it will navigate me to CodeScan's website where I can read descriptions with examples for all of the rules that we have in this category. So if I want to just spend an hour of my time but to define a great rule set, I will go through this documentation and I will enable corresponding rules. So I'll get back to the ID. And for, for all of these rules that we enable or disable, like avoid deeply nested if statements, yes, of course. We can specify here the depths of uh, problems. So for example, if three levels of nested ifs is okay or no, in this case, it's not okay, but we can make it even two. It's too much for me. I can manually change or override the default priority for this rule. So by default, it's three, but I can make it as a, a critical urgent one, the most important, issue for me, or I can make this as low pre as possible. So it's just a warning. It's kind of good to have, but nobody cares. In my case, it will be two, for example. So what else do we have here? We have lots of different things about equals to now. So test for now shouldn't use the equals method. Yep, makes sense, makes sense. Immutable field, I don't care about it being honest uncommented empty constructors. So as you can see, there is a lot of rules, like 41 for design. Let's take a look at what we have in optimizations. Avoid a SOC when control or getter. Yes, local variable could be fine, I don't care. Avoid instantiation objects in loops, okay. Avoid a SOC without limits, of course. Future method in loops, yes. Okay, I just go with all of them. I really like optimizations, so I will go with them. We have a bunch of naming. Uh, rule sets. I don't have any specific like naming uh, preferences in my teams and in my like personally. I prefer C sharp notation, but it's not applicable for Apex, so I am just silent and I don't care about naming for now. So I will just not check anything. Ben, do you have any favorite rules? Um, what's on the bug ones uh, under 
um, yeah, basic. There's some good ones in there, and the, and probably the great, some of the best ones are in unit tests uh, because that really helps you uh, yeah. nail down some of the um, uh, some of the cheaters who like to write unit tests without <laughs> test, uh, running in your session. <laughs> of course, yeah, yeah, yeah. I I, I don't know how it means this. So we should have assertions for sure. We should have assertions with messages. And unit test should include start test. I don't care about this one. Yeah. Avoid using test as well. So I'd like to point out that this is what you're doing now is a very important process um, as far as setting up is in concern. Uh, simply because if if you set up too many, uh, you'll you'll start ignoring the problems. <laughs> if you set up and if you set up too few, of course, you don't get the full value of the, of the, of the tool. Uh, yeah. Agree, agree. It's, it's it's one of the most important cases, especially if you're dealing with legacy projects or okay, like with existing projects with a huge code base. You will for sure will be overwhelmed with a number of violations. So you should be very careful when defining new rule sets. You might start with the smaller steps, and then like make make it harder, stricter with any iteration or like every quarter or maybe once in a couple months. So let me just select a couple unit tests and cool sets. It will be priority number one. Uh, and there's a few security rules that what people will ask about. There, there are some security rules down the bottom. Uh, yep. So these cover off a lot of the, the typical um, uh, OWASP type things. Yep, it makes sense. I believe, especially for those who are doing managed packages, especially. But in general, yes, security, of course, matters for everybody. But okay, so thanks Ben for your input. I've saved a rule set. I can go through here for hours. You see guys, there's a lot of rules and most of them are pretty interested. Uh, this one as well. So I will save the rule set. I will save it as an XML file to the same folder with my project. So it will be rule set XML. Once saved, what I will do here, I will navigate in my solution explorer to the project itself. I will right click on the project and select properties. Right here, I can, in the upper part of the properties, I have cross-scan settings. So I can select the rule set file. I will point it to my XML file. I can set the error priority. So it means that everything that has priority three and higher will be treated as error, while four and five will be treated as warning. So let it leave as this, but in our case, like as we've like both this Ben pointed to you. So if you have legacy code, you might set up some priorities for some of the rules to be one, for example, the ones that you think that are mandatory and critical for your kind of business. And everything else left like two, three, or maybe even lower. And in that case, you can change error priority to one. So instead of getting thousands of errors, you'll get only 10, but critical ones that you need to fix immediately. I'll leave it as three. So I hit apply, and now this project is tied up with this rule set. And the ID will use this rule set for all the code scan scans for this project. So how you can perform a code scan? You can right click in any Apex project that you have here and select scan with code scan. If you open your code scan report panel, that will show you results once they are done. Okay, I will point error list here. So you can see the results in the code scan report, or you can see them in the regular error list, and you can of course see them in the editor highlighted and shown on the code map. So you see guys, we have here 80 lines of code and we have 31 error. So it's like one rule violation in every two lines, okay, two and a half lines. So let's take a look what we have here. We have psychometric complexity. Yeah, it doesn't look good. Again, psychometric complexity, deeply nested two statements. I can click on any rule here and any violation and go directly to that point in the code where it was violated. And use it local variables that school that it detects it for me. Yes, it's not being used anywhere. What we have here. Avoid empty cache blocks. Yes, it's priority number one. Like really, guys, I hope nobody writes such code. So what do we have here? Avoid the stock yellow loops and lots of other issues. I can split them by categories. So take a look what we have in code size, what we have in optimizations, nothing. What we have in basic, again, nothing. 
and I can just select everything. Or I can view trials one by one, or I can even export them to CSV file just to share with somebody else. At the same time, I can just open the Solution Explorer and right-click on any file here and also select scan with code scan. It will do just the same that we've seen here, but for another file. Again, we have 175 lines, lines and 48 errors, too much. But the most like weird thing to do or crazy thing to do is just to right-click. So you can even select a bunch of files, right-click on them and execute scan with code scan. Or you can right click on any folder and also click on the scan with code scan option. It will execute the code scan for all of the Apex classes found inside of this folder. So, yeah, we do not support yet uh, code scan rules for visual force for lightning, so it will be somewhere in the future. But for now, it's working only for Apex. It takes some time. It takes some time because I have here a couple hundred fields, uh, sorry, classes, but afterwards I believe I'll get a good result. Okay, we have one question here. So will it be possible to deploy the priority settings to other users? So in the case that I'm showing you, it's the easiest one with just like, uh, let's say like inline execution by developers. So it's regular XML rule set file, so it can be shared with different people. But I think that more complex ones, more complex flows, more, more advanced flows will be shown to you by Ben. And in that case, everything about like, applying the settings for the whole team are much, much more easier. You guys, I just feel welcome. I think the webinar is already okay because I've had a crash or something just frozen. Right as it should be on the demo. So from what I remember, from what I've tried previously on all my code base with the default rule set uh, defined by the guys from CodeScan, it was about 1,300 violations for my code base. So you might guess that we've enabled a couple of base rules. It should be something about like 2,000 violations in my code base, and this is why it takes so long. So again, like, be careful with setting up all of the issues, all of the rules, just to not get overwhelmed and not to stop ignoring them because like really who deal with 1000 issues. I wanted to show you another option here. So let me show you another example, how you can execute the code scan for your changed files. So again, I'll go to the project, I'll open properties. So I already have here all set file specified, but I, but I can run code scan before build. So if I change this to true, this will execute the code scan scan for only changed files before sending them to Salesforce. So let me check some, change some comment. I'll hit F5. And as the first step, you can see that the working suite executes code scan check. And as there are lots of issues, it won't allow this file to get to Salesforce. So in my case, I need to fix all of the stuff or just disable code scan to get my ugly smelly code to Salesforce. So with this option, it's great if you have clean code, it's great if you have very mild rule set, but in case of complex things, like really you have 48 rules that you need to fix before committing the changes to Salesforce. But otherwise, it's really great thing to just keep everything uh, in a good shape, in a good state, without applying any CIs or any other uh, team workflows. And Ben will show you that workflows, how to work better and nicer with the teamwork in the code scan, I believe. Am I right? Yes, yes, I'll, we'll go through that. So, okay, and I think from my side, so this is how you can use uh, code scan in the working suite. It's very easy, it doesn't require you anything to do, and it's a great jump start to start experiencing all the 180 plus rules for Apex from code scan. So it's just going to tools, options, entering your license, creating a rule set in the rule set configurator, attaching it to the project, and then just start using. For more advanced stuff, I'm switching presenter to Ben, and he will show you other nice things. Okay. So, um, what I want to show you is, well, first of all, uh, this is our website. You can go to it and, um, um, you can uh, see the pricing there, and uh, you can, if you 
if you need to run your tool uh, locally, there's a hosted version. Otherwise, there's a cloud version. Um, yes, and um, so let me jump over to we've got the cloud version here. Um, so this is a, um, an overview page. So um, we've got all of the rules um, that have been analysed on the entire code base. So so um, so this is more looking at at the entire code base rather than just a single file. It's um, and it, and it's built into your workflow. So rather than um, uh, it being part of uh, an IDE, it's it's um, what a lot of people will do. Um, so there's several ways to get our information into this uh, into this tool. You can um, obviously hook up uh, the Salesforce um, um, system directly. So we've got this uh, section here called um, um, uh, Project Analysis, where you can uh, you can add your own. Uh, I'll show it to you. You can, you can add a new uh, project uh, and connect it up to GitHub, Bitbucket. Uh, but also Salesforce, you can um, hook it up to an environment, which will then um, uh, scan it on a, on a, on a regular basis. Um, we've also got um, the ability to um, run um, uh, based on, on, on pull requests. So let's see if I can find an example. Um, this looks like a promising one. So you can see here that this um, this project here has um, some some changes, and under here we can see that there has been a pull request, uh, i.e., so um, a pull request is a, is a is a is a some changes that you intend to commit um, to your code base. Um, this you can set this up in GitHub or Bitbucket uh, for those uh, who have done it. So. As soon as you commit that code to GitHub or Bitbucket, uh, it's uh, we scan it here on uh, on CodeScan and we show you that show you the uh, the changes and um, and we also report back onto the pull request. So here's the pull request and we'll actually put this see this this um, this X here to show that this pull request has failed. Um, So um, if if we were to go through that code and fix those problems, or uh, another thing we can do is we can also mark mark the changes as um, as a false positive, or that we're not going to fix the problem, um, and then that would um, that would feed that bit information back. So um, let's do that real quick. So we can, for example, we, we, I mean, really we should uh, fix these things. But we can we can also just flag it and uh, as won't fix or false positive, and then that information should come back normally onto pull request. I think um, it's probably because I'm not signed in. I won't show you that right now. Anyway, so um, back to the actual tool. Um, we've got so the so the workflow is as I said pull requests. Um, and, and um, but the, the other benefits that we have here is that, they, that, that all the measures are, are nicely presented in this tool. Um, you can you can see a lot of things. Uh, you can see, uh, um, uh, for example, here's a, a beautiful scatter plot showing um, the maintainability of various classes versus their uh, code size. And uh, screens like this are really important. Uh, for figuring out what you are going to focus on when, uh, um, for example, if you want to do a sprint or some work on, on improving the, co the quality of the code, rather than focusing here on these um, these files, which they might also need a, a bit, uh, um, some, some work, but here, here these outliers are, um, you know, very buggy code that are, um, that are rather big. Um, Likewise, with code coverage, uh, we've, we don't have not all code is uh, um, is covered the same. So here, for example, we've got an outlier. This is a, a badly covered. It's only got 20% coverage, and, and the cyclomatic complexity, which is a measure of how um, how much how complex the code is, how many if statements and, and loops and things like that. Um, you know, 
So, so this file here is, um, you, you would find a lot of, oh, there you go, lots of four for loops and lots of problems in it. Um, this looks very similar to uh, another music example. Um, so yeah, so rather than focusing here on the, you know, the, the, the well-covered, well, maybe, maybe not these ones up here, but you know, the well-covered ones that are fairly simple, these, these are great. This quadrant is good and this quadrant is very bad. Um, so issues, uh, so th it's also a, um, a code review uh, platform, so you can you can assign uh, issues. I'm not, I'm not a uh, administrator, it seems. Um, yeah, on these ones, you can assign issues. You can uh, mark them as resolved and, and so forth. So. Um, I was not logged in correctly. Okay, so, so you can actually assign these uh, these problems to people uh, in your team uh, for for resolution, and um, you can even comment on the issues themselves. You can say, you know, something like that. And um, you have uh, quality profiles, which are like rule sets, and you can um, you can build your own rule sets. Uh, um, which are, uh, yeah, as I said, group, groups of of, um, of issues. The issues can um, so in in uh, the code scan we, we do check uh, visual flaws and uh, and things like that. Um, there's also um, uh, we've released a new version. I think we've got a few more rules, so up to uh, uh, something over 200 rules now. Um, the other thing is we have. Uh, um, Custom rules. Uh, I, I think uh, Welcome Suite supports this as well, but you can write your own custom rules based on XPath. Uh, so uh, if you imagine a, a class being a uh, set of parent child relations, you know, the children being the fields and the methods, uh, you can, um, and that translates to, to an XML document, if you can sort of imagine how that would work. And then you can use a language called XPath, which is an XML search language. Um, just find uh, uh, children and, and, and tags on that XML um, structure, which uh, which fit a certain pattern. For example, here we have an XPath statement that's looking for uh, a class uh, variable uh, whose uh, name or image is factory, and it's not uh, not declared as final. Um, yeah, and then this rule can be run in your own org. Um, so back to the uh, to the workflow, we have this thing called quality gates. Quality gates are taking any of, of the metrics that you're working with and um, and and using it to flag uh, a problem. And the, the problem would then uh, be displayed on the project. So then, at a glance, you can say this project is not okay and and not to deploy that into production, which is um, I guess your your uh, your um, stopping uh, any bad code from from getting into production. Um, I might leave it at that. Um, so, so in in summary, you know, it's it's about workflows. We've got uh, Visual Force and lots of new rules in this in this version, the cloud um, version, and uh, custom rules. I think if that's all, I'll throw it back to you, uh, Vladimir. It it looks really great, Ben. When I like the visual representation, I like them like reports, and it's really cool when you need to analyze the state of your code base, state of your project. It's like really cool, and I think that like one of the best use cases would be to use all together, like in it in the working suite and like on the developer side, and together like as a, as a gateway, as you've like shown us, so like both developers can get the immediate feedback instead of waiting for something to happen later. But at the same time, you'll get the whole picture of the whole code base from all your team, and you'll be able to set the quality gates. So nothing won't appear in your production or like UAT or any other environment with like any significant issues. So it really looks pretty nice for me. And like, yeah, I really enjoyed this part that you've shown me. Thanks, like not me, everybody. Okay. Uh, just to also then, 
because we're checking the entire code base rather than just a single file, that we also can point out several things like code duplication, you know, when you've got the same piece of code in multiple places. So um, yeah, that's another, another small benefit, which I think, um, so we can see that this cyclomatic test, for example, uh, is 94% uh, duplication. Um, there's the duplicate, I guess. Um, you can see that here as well. Yeah. Looks nice, looks nice and helpful in sales for what especially. So uh, I think in this case it's all for us. I have just like a last slide showing that thank you guys and we'll stay here for Q&A but I won't interrupt Ben's screen sharing because I believe he might want to show something while answering questions. So, yep, thank you very much for your attention, guys, and you we'll stay here for another five to ten minutes to answer your questions. And just in case, if we won't be able to answer questions right now, we'll do this for sure later in emails or somehow other way. So I see here one question about Welkin. And so the question is, we are currently using the CodeScan plugin for Sonar. Is there a way to export the rule set we have configured there so that we have the same configuration in Welkin? So thanks, Janet, for a good question. Right now, no, there is no such ability. I believe that your rule set is like handcrafted and it like took a lot of time to do it great. Right now, we don't have such like way out of the box. I believe if you chat with Ben, somehow you'll find a hacky way to do this. But like the kind of official correct way, we don't have it for now. But I believe in the future, we'll make our integration deeper. And in this way, you'll be able to get reports and to like, interact with CodeScan, with SonarCube, or the cloud version better. Yeah, I think um, I think in the future, we'd, 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 um, you can back up your quality profiles, and we could use that as huh. a sort of a tool to help us um, uh, um, in the future. <laughs> yeah, it should work. This then it should work, I believe. I believe you have a couple questions for CodeScan or no? Question there about triggers. Um, yes, absolutely. It checks. Um, there's quite a few different uh, trigger type rules. Um, let me see if I can find an example. Um, triggers, here we go. So, there's a few here. Um, avoid logic and triggers, um, circle injection possibility, that's its trick, using unescaped uh, things, um, deeply nested if, unused variable, there you go. It also checks, uh, Aura uh, code. So, um, I don't have any good Aura code here at the moment. Just some examples here, but there's no issues in it. I think they're all empty code. Yeah, it's all empty. So, no. Um, uh, the, the nice thing about uh, SonarCube is it also has a uh, um, it is so uh, you can also check your JavaScript and other other languages. There's uh, plugins for lots of different languages. So you can, uh, if you have other projects or other languages like JavaScript and CSS, uh, there's, there's, there are plugins for uh, for this um, tool that we use um, uh, to check those languages as well. Somebody asked about a hosted version. Uh, yes, there is a hosted version. Um, it's an uh, app. Uh, well, you look at it on our website. You'll see um, a hosted version. You can go down to the bottom and get started. There's a sign up here. You can get going with. Yeah, and the, the hosted version um, does have um, support for several other languages, including JavaScript. Yeah, there's about 200 rules for JavaScript as well. Uh, there's a question here about um, embedded JavaScript. Interestingly, that is 
part of the upcoming sprint. So uh, I'll get back to you about that. <laughs> Just in time question. Uh, command line, uh, no, we don't offer that at the moment. Oh, sorry. Um, yeah, the command line um, is not is not a currently an option. Um, if there are a few ways to get uh, um, the code out, I believe there's an XML export plugin from Sonar Cube, um, but not a command line tool. Um, and I believe uh, Welcome Suite has a way of exporting XML. Is that right, Vladimir? Uh, yeah. Yeah. Okay, guys, I think that we'll wrap up. And if you don't mind, I'll share just like the last slide from the presentation. So thank you very much, guys, for your attention and for your time. Thank you, Ben, for joining us and showing the great power of Code Scan to us. And for all the questions that we haven't answered, a couple of them that we haven't yet answered, we'll get back to you guys later. And just in case, if you have any more questions, if you want to get in touch with me or with Ben, so you have our contacts here, you can find us on Twitter, you can find us on our websites, and just in any way you can find us, we'll be happy to answer any of your additional questions, comments, suggestions, ideas, so anything that you have in mind, just feel free to let us know. And we'll get back to you with recording of the webinar in a couple of days, as well as with answers to questions that you might have not answered. Yep. And, uh... For CodeScan, if you go to a website, uh, which um, is uh, www.code-scan.com, uh, there's some contact buttons on the, on the cloud version or any of the versions, really. And just send us an email and we will get back to you. Okay, guys, so thank you very much and have a great day, evening, morning, whatever you have in your time zone. And see you later. Bye. Thanks for joining us.